Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Bird. I'm a biblical scholar, and I've had some folks express an interest in a footsteps of Paul kind of a trip. And I have to say that um, I do bring a little bit more to it from a feminist perspective and maybe a little more critical perspective than what many trips like this will look like just FYI. And I've taken two trips in the past, and we call it Footsteps of Paul, but it also includes some sites that are mentioned in Revelation, and they actually, a couple of those happen to be some of my favorite spots to go to. So, thought I'd put together a little presentation and to let you see what kinds of things we would be visiting and seeing, um, and to see if you're interested And in that, uh, right, just to give you a little taste. So, here we go. Um, you do fly in and out of Istanbul. And so we start off the trip there. And this was taken when we did a trip, just a trip up and down the Bosphorus. Um, so the sea, you know, the water, um, the body of water that divides Istanbul. So the Istanbul as a city is uh, predominantly in Asia, but there's a part of it that is in the European side um, of, and it's, that's the, where all the good stuff is. <laughs> I guess most of Istanbul is in, on that side, but Turkey itself is predominantly on the Asian continent. So anyway, so this is, these are just some of the things that we saw when I did, when we did a boat ride on the Bosphorus. I'm not sure if that's going to be a part of this trip, but this is the, we're standing in the outer court of the Blue Mosque, if you've heard of it. If you haven't, go, please go look it up. Lots of great history here, all kinds of interesting things, but this is a large, beautiful, very well-known mosque named because of the number of blue ceramic tiles on the inside. And what you can, there's all kinds of fun things you can see here. This is a place where people wash their hands and feet before they go in to pray. And they will do that year round. And Istanbul can get pretty cold. Um, but, and that is true of mosques anywhere. There's a um, wa washing your hands and feet um, and face before you go in. <clears throat> so many just cool things here. Um, that was backwards, I think. And I didn't mean to do that. And anyway, the, the architecture, stunning, all the things that you get to take in. It's really lovely. This is looking up at a ceiling, um, just to show you some design. I'm not going to get into all the specifics here, but this is inside the Blue Mosque. So you can see how there's a great deal of blue on the walls. And also, I'm trying to capture over here on the right-hand side that how large the, um, the pillars are. You probably won't see it this empty if we go. <laughs> This was taken in 2009 in spring, and so things are different now. But the area that you can see in terms of the carpet, that's all where men would be. And there's a section for women at the back. It's separate. Um, and we do cover our shoes instead of everybody taking them off if there's a lot of people. But I don't know if this art appeals to you, but I find it really you know, beautiful in its own way and intriguing, all the beautiful colors and the Islamic... Um, writings and sayings all over the place, all over the you know, over the doorways. Um, and this is in one of the markets that we uh, tend to visit early on, like you know the first day or two when we're in Istanbul. And there will be markets like this throughout the you know every now and then. But this is a pretty large, well-known one in Istanbul. So um, Turkish delight, <laughs> all the different um, nuts and uh, just various pieces of. Uh, fruit and dried fruit and things. And um, if this kind of thing appeals to you, right? The uh, the evil eye. So the evil eye then you would have to protect yourself from danger is, is the idea here. Um, <clears throat> so this is the outside of the Blue Mosque. So from a different perspective, essentially. Beautiful. And there's Again, there's so much to say, so much to talk about, but I will not get into that. Just going to do the quick, you know, showing you, exposing you to some of these things. This is inside the um, Hagia Sophia, or as people tend to say in English, the Hagia Sophia. It is also, it has now been changed back to a mosque. Um, and so its history, it started in the fourth century, was built was burned down, was rebuilt, and so for at least a thousand years, it was um, it was a, it was a 
cathedral, so it was a Christian building, the Hagia Sophia, <clears throat> and then when the Turks took over, they turned it into a mosque. What they did was try to cover over the Christian icons and whatnot instead of destroying them, which meant that in the early 20th century, when it was turned into a museum, they could start to remove some of um, the things covering those old icons, and you could and we started to see, discover these icons that people hadn't seen before, or, you know, in over a thousand years. Um, just really beautiful and stunning. So there's a lot of history here as well. The, I, I love these pillars, these marble pillars, I just think are just beautiful. Um, so let me be clear, this has, this building is now, it was a museum and it has just recently in the last couple of years been turned back into a mosque. So I don't know what it will look like on the inside at this point. But one of the reasons I like to point out these marble pillars is because some of the marble, well, the marble for this building came from all around the Mediterranean, but most significantly from one of the seven wonders of the world, which was the temple to Artemis in the town of Ephesus, which we get to go look at on this trip. Um, so I like to highlight it because this is just a stunning building. We're on the second floor, by the way, <clears throat> and, and it, is there in part because of Christians destroying one of the ancient wonders of the world. So this is one of the icons, um, one of the frescoes that that they started to discover, and then they realized that having <laughs> that it was actually better for the building overall if they didn't try to remove um, all of the stucco that they covered it with. So anyway, so there some of these are just quite beautiful. In, again, tells a moment in history, but I particularly, you'll see this per, this part of this icon, um, this image in um, on book covers, and it's a fascinating thing to me to have him holding um, an image that represents the power of the church and also wealth and power of the military. Like, so this is, you know, this is obviously a Christian symbol, but it is uh, it has been hijacked by the, by power instead of representing right the things that Jesus would have been killed for standing up for. This is actually on the first floor in the outer courts of the same building, the Hagia Sophia. So you can see this just the marvelous marble, all kinds of stuff. And these um, these lanterns or lighting fixtures had used to have candles in them they're now being lit with electricity but those date to the the dark air to the i think to the 1200s and there are quite a few of those in within this building we're still in the hagia sophia <laughs> so <laughs> um these discs were added to to turn it into a mosque right so these are um the sayings for um muhammad peace be upon him and uh, his there is no God but Allah and, and Muhammad is his prophet. So many things I could point out, but I'm going to keep moving. Obviously, you can tell this was it was being cleaned um, at, when I was there in, two, in 2010. This is outside the Topkapi Palace, which is one of my favorite places to visit in Istanbul because it gives you access to a really impressive and delightful museum in terms of archaeological finds. I don't, you know, again, it's just hit and miss in terms of what you actually get to do on any given trip, but that's what that's where this picture is taken. Troy is um, so then we go over to the Asian continent and we start to work our way down the coast of Turkey. And Troy is one of the cities that we visit because because it talks about Paul visiting Troas um, at least once, if not twice. And so, so then when you get to Troy, you're in this whole other thing because there were at least nine different cities of Troy over the centuries. And so the one that Paul would have visited, I believe is number six. Don't quote me on that, but it's, you can, so, so you can see the stratification here. There are, there are, um, I just find all this stuff really cool to look at. Very, I mean, you can see the outlines of people's lives. You know, I just find it really interesting. This is here because of a saying that's on this headstone. Um, all kinds of fun, interesting things. And the, the intricate work, right? This is at the top. This would have been hanging over, would have been across the top of the walkway, right? Um, this really beautiful, intricate work in marble, right? It's quite heavy. And this one, this picture shows you, you can see there's a number three here, there's a city number four, number three. So you can see multi, and up here is number nine, right? <clears throat> 
so nine cities, and I think Paul visited number six, but I'm not. Anyway, so, but you get the idea. That's, so we're, we're not just doing Paul all the time or not just um, things related to Revelation. So we're looking at what's going on here <clears throat> and trying to appreciate what's going on. So there was a, another excavation at work <laughs> on my second, my first trip there, I guess. First or third, I'm not sure. Anyway, <coughs> on down the coast. You may have paid. You may have seen in uh, current, recently in the news that Izmir has shown up. So I don't know if Izmir would be a place where we would stay or not, but it is a place I stayed a couple times when I did this tour. It's a coast town. It's beautiful. Has lovely things going on, and we were there over uh, December thirty one to January first. So one year. Um, you know, we did get to see some fireworks. So those were two of my students at the time. Um, <laughs> great guys. Um, but that's just to stop off onto the next. And Pergamon is one of my favorite. It's one of the top three or four places, probably my top, you know, third, whatever, third favorite place to visit. So in terms of archaeological finds and what this location can tell us about understanding Newer Testament writings. So Pergamon is one of the one of the churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. And so this is this just kind of helps you see not just for the city, not just for the town of Pergamon in the first century, but for what Christians were experiencing in general. Um, huge thing to talk about here, right? So much going on. The gem here for me is what we're looking at now is are the remains of the Temple to Trajan, which have been rebuilt. They've actually tried to reestablish it since I took this picture in 2009. So again, I don't know what it looks like now. <clears throat> A little, little playfulness here. But this is in the main part of town, and Pergamum is on a hill. So the higher up you go, the more important. Lower down you go, the less power, importance, whatever, right? Influence. This is in the main part of town. This is a temple to the emperors. And this is, again, that's a whole conversation to have. But this is what is being referred to in that passage addressed to Pergamon in Revelation as the throne of Satan. This is it, the temple to the emperors. Biblical archaeologists discovered a different temple, which I'll point out in a moment, the temple to Zeus, or the altar to Zeus, and they thought that, that was the throne of Satan, which makes no sense whatsoever, <laughs> unless you are thinking about these, the book of Revelation through a spiritual lens. But the book of Revelation needs to be understood through political and economic and actual s suffering of Christians who were not going out to honor the emperor, okay? Anyway, this is an Odeon on the side of the hill. They still have concerts here every every now and then, which is kind of fascinating. This is a this is a biblical scholar. Her name is Antoinette Clark Wire. She wrote a book, um, the Corinthian Women Prophets, which is formative in understanding what Paul was doing in his cor Corinthian correspondences. And this is the top of a Corinthian column. So that was a fun picture to take with her. Um, <clears throat> She was. She and I were on the the trip to kind of get to know and get to see some of these things. So, this is we're still in Pergamum, and this is the storage space underneath the temple. So this is yeah. I again great image, um, but off to the to our left um, over here. These are all storage spaces. So each each entryway was a place where things were stored for the for the running of the temple and whatnot. Beautiful. Here's here here's the remains. Here's the spot where the altar to Zeus was, and yes, the parts that they discovered they pulled apart and took to. They're in a. Last I heard, I should probably look into this. Uh, they were in a museum in Berlin, and it's this temple of Zeus was labeled Throne of Satan, which is not correct. But millions of people have come to this site and been told that. <laughs> perpetuating the misinformation and the, the lack of understanding what's going on. So anyway, there you have it. That's the way it goes. We're still in Pergamum here. Um, this was my first trip. Some of the people in that, on that group. Um, Sardis is another one of my favorite cities to visit. And that is also a, a city referenced in the book of Revelation. And this is outside, outside of the main part of town. This was, and if you can see, if you look closely, this, these are the humans on the trip, right? So it is a massive, it was a massive temple. And I believe this was also to Artemis. Something about it, the location in the, on the side, at the bottom of a hill, there was something pastoral and beautiful and regal about it. I, 
just it's hard to it's hard to put words to these things. One of the things you see throughout these ancient sites um, is that a building that would have been used for any lots of reasons has is gets baptized or Christianized by adding a cross. So chiseling down, right, and leaving just a cross is a way to designate that. And you see that in lots of these sites around the region. My mother and father went with me on this, on my first trip, and this is my mother on the right. This is our tour guide on the left. We're outside, we're still in Sardis, and this this is a row of shops. Um, and you, there's some interesting anna, annotations, um, interesting things that were written in, in stone or that we've dis, that they've discovered to help you understand what's going on in these different places. But this, the other side of this row is a synagogue. <clears throat> and this is part of that synagogue. And again, you can see the spaciousness of it. I, one of my favorite things about this is what this altar tells us. These are lions, so feline, feline are off, you know, so many things I want to talk about. Ah, keep it simple. And then this is my second trip. This is the group for my second trip. But you can't see the felines very well here guarding this altar, right? These eggs, right? This uh, representation of fertility. Also things that you see in the Artemis temple. All kinds of things at the temple of Artemis that I, again, didn't point out, didn't have time. But, but you can see on the top when you get up close to this altar that it was used for animal sacrifice. It is a synagogue and there's a drain for it for the blood to run off. And then looking at the, the feet here, these are, I can't remember if these are eagle or if it was eagle talons or if it was bovine also. Bovine, not bovine, that's obviously not. Feline, we have animals being used in synagogues to represent the divine, the majesty, the, all the different characteristics of the divine being, right? All those comments about not using that, not just not using images to, to represent God, people were doing it anyway, right? And the mixture of cultures, right? The mixture of that this is a synagogue, Jewish synagogue that's taking fully taking in Greek symbols to represent what they're trying to say. All kinds of mosaics all over the place that I just think are so beautiful and interesting and the fact that they're still there after 2,000 years, I think, is amazing. <laughs> anyway, this is still part of Sardis, uh, the gymnasium, and some really massive buildings to indicate it was a bit of a thriving city in its day, right? There's a reason why the seven cities that are named in the book of Revelation are named, and it's because they were big and important. They weren't the only seven churches in that area, right? Again, being playful, I'm, I wonder if um, we're not actually supposed to be doing that, getting on top of it, <laughs> but it's fun. And part just also to show the size, so. Right, one of the, t I guess this was, I don't know if it was the first or the third trip as we were looking around this temple, um, it was the it was the third trip, yeah. Um, this flock of sheep came running through while we were. It was just this interesting clash of things. But also, one of the things about these pillars is you see along the bottom a lot of um, these ridges. The rings around um, often look like different types of um, animals, what am I, reptiles. <laughs> so this the realm of snakes, the you know using snakes or a representation of snakes in the midst is common, but it's positive in their setting. Ephesus is definitely my favorite ancient site to visit. And again, I f there is there are a couple hours of things to talk about <laughs> in terms of Ephesus itself. It's really rich in terms of understanding first and second century Christianity, um, the ideas around women and leadership. And uh, it's, it's, you know, the it's stunning, actually, the amount of content that coalesces here. So again, I can't get into all of it. <clears throat> Love it though. This is this is the town on the coast closest to the city, the ancient site of Ephesus. So that's where we stayed um, once or twice when I've done this trip. This is okay. So now we're in the upper level of of Ephesus. If you're visiting, if you enter the city from the mainland, <clears throat> this is how you enter the city. The bulletarion here is what we're looking at. So the place where legal issues would be decided. There is um, an ancient, let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure I included it in this presentation, but they used to think that this was 
um, a graveyard, which is one of the things that they did in this region, but they would normally have the graveyard outside of town. So when someone visits, the first they will see are those who have died. And if you know scripture well, first think of first and second Thessalonians and the, those who are dead in Christ shall be raised. And when you visit, a visitation is what all these different ideas and language kind of overlap here. They've since decided this wasn't actually um, a graveyard, which makes more sense to me because it's an awkward place to have that. I don't remember what they've decided is since, but still I've, there are other sites that I've been to in, in this part of Turkey, ancient Asia Minor, where they did have massive graveyards outside of town so that that's who you visit first when you, paris, uh, parousia is a visitation. Parousia is the return of Christ or that concept of the return of Son of Man. Okay. <coughs> One of the things about the city of Ephesus, as I said, is the role of women in leadership and the role of women and how, what the choices they make in terms of whether or not to become, to get married and have children. And so it's actually somewhat remarkable that Augustus and Livia are just both presented and not just Augustus. So there's an emphasis on families. There's an emphasis on having children building up the empire's, you know, population. Augustus, Octavian, Augustus was the first uh, emperor and he he did give a tax credit for people, a tax break, right? If you had, if you have children. So all kinds of visual representations of power and of essentially propaganda of what you should be thinking and doing and valuing. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is a representation of healing. The, the god Asclepius is associated with healing. And so this is a way to say here is the hospital, right? Um, there are a lot of feral dogs and cats in, that I've seen in both in Greece and in Turkey, the western part of Turkey at least, especially at these sites. I will tell you that in Turkey at least they are monitored and spayed and neutered and taken care of to a certain degree. Um, <clears throat> Side note, but this is a this is Nike or Nike as some people say, um, the goddess of victory, and you will see her all over the place. And it's again, it's a form of propaganda. There's um, you know the display of or the reassurance of the power of the empire, so forth and so on. Okay, this this looks a bit different at this point. I know that even just a few years later when I went, but this is still a helpful image in my opinion. This is, um, we're entering kind of the more commercial space of Ephesus, the main, this main street, if you will. And you can see things happening over here on the left, and you can see some things happening here on the right. This is, we're going to zoom in on this particular um, temp, um, altar. This is the library at the end of the street. Um, the third largest library in the ancient world was here in Ephesus. Um, one of the things that's different now is they have done a lot more excavating on both sides, but they had, in the same way that we do now in a big city, you'll have stores on the first level and then living quarters above. They, they had the same thing going on here. And this would date, this particular level dates to, well, to shortly after Paul, so 200, 300 common era. Um, so this is, these are the shops on the right hand side. And I used to, you know, I like to just kind of play with the idea that according to the book of Acts, Paul lived here a couple years. Who knows if it's true. Uh, but I like to think of him having a tent shop here, right? And these, these pedestals were for statues of the benefit the benefactors of, in town so that you can be reminded on a daily basis that this this beautiful city is brought to you by and you get to see all the you know all the representatives of wealth in town right on the left hand side of the street are rather wealthy living quarters that they've started to excavate and this to me is important because of the letter of first timothy that talks about wealthy women who gad about and, and tell stories and all kinds of things right they they have free time because they have wealth and they like to hear um, and learn from the philosophers who come through town people have always been curious intellectually it's just a matter of whether or not you have time to indulge that right so there are important things that collide here in the town of ephesus and this is some of the mosaics outside of those wealthier apartments, if you will. 
condos, whatever. <laughs> this is the temp the art altar that I pointed out a couple slides ago. And so this is over the archway. Um, sorry. Um, this is Medusa. She isn't always upside down, but you often see her rep uh, represented sideways or upside down. All the lore associated with that. <clears throat> um, this, so this is around the, the top on the inside. And over here on the left, the, this panel and the one uh, perpendicular to it tell the history of the city. This is over to the right when you walk in. And these are all gods, goddesses, emperors, and empresses. So these are all people who are venerated at this altar. And this is central to understanding First Peter, the letter of First Peter, the book of Revelation. And even as well as um, First Timothy and the ideas around where Paul got this idea of egalitarian roles within Christ. Um, <clears throat> just the idea of women in leadership. And then when you have later ideas telling women they can't teach and have authority, those all collide here. <laughs> it's amazing. And so uh, I... I do have a list of who we think each of these characters are, right? So I, the, the goddess Isis is in here, so is Artemis, so, is, so are a couple emperors and Aphrodite and, you know, Dionysus, like all the good, all the good ones, right? And this is public urinal, um, would have been, had walls but not a roof, just to let things air out. Um, the guy on the right was our tour guide, um, so I've done this tour with him three times. This is a younger me, for sure. Um, and that's the library in the background, third largest library in the ancient world. And that's including Alexandria. So Alexandria was the largest, but this is the second or third largest. So this is second largest. And then the library in Pergamum was the third largest. So anyway, so that's, um, there's again, there's more to tell here. Uh, let's see, do I have... Let me just do this real quickly. And then this, the, there's, a, there's a small mountain ridge over here to the left. And that is where we see, discover um, images that refer to Paul and Tekla, the story of Acts of Paul and Tekla. So that is a part of the mix here in Ephesus. Okay. Um, this is some of the wealthy apartments that they've unearthed and, uh, you know, cleaned up. And I just, okay, this is 2,500 years old paint. Like, that's just beautiful. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? <laughs> sure, it's been covered over, but like, that's amazing. So all kinds of mosaics. Um, reminds me of some of the apartments I've seen in New York City. You know, like it just, these things are, you know, some of these things don't change about us. There's a lot going on in this Inscription, Emperor Caesar, Divi Filius, Augustus, Pontificus Maximus, um, Caesar, so Livia and Augustus. Um, but what it's what caught me the first time, right, was Divi Filius, son of God, Emperor Caesar, son of God, Augustus, Pontificus Maximus. This is the the most the highest of the high honorific of a of an emperor, and even calling him son of God. Right. This is a visual reminding you that emperor is the son of God. And the this is over the doorway that leads into the shopping district. <laughs> so going about your daily life, you are reminded with visual propaganda of your place in life, as well as who you need to be thankful for. Um, and this is part of that shopping district. Um, again, just all kinds of just beautiful. So here is the Artemis affiliated with Ephesus. She was discovered, this statue was discovered in the region, in this region of Ephesus. So the, the temple to Artemis in Ephesus was one of the ancient, seven ancient wonders of the world, right? This goddess, this is it, her. <laughs> and there is only one stand, one pillar remaining of that ancient temple. The rest of it has been destroyed and used to build Christian buildings. So there's all that. Um, all of these things on Artemis uh, represent fertility, for good fortune, all kinds of stuff here, right? I, the the griffs, the glyph, griffs, griffiths, all eggs, right? Um, fertility, all kinds of things associated with her. Why she is the the goddess of this town, Ephesus. She's the patron goddess, if you will. 
And this is in that cave that I mentioned where we have images that relate to the story of the Acts of Paul and Tekla. Again, I'm trying to keep this video short. I, there are, again, I can just, there is so much to say about the town of Ephesus. So this is a stunning find in the walls of this cave outside of the town of Ephesus. This is Paul. This is Theoclea, the mother of, um, of Fe Te Tekla. So lots of things to say about these two images. One is that Paul, they both are holding up their hands in a teaching authority position. Paul is fine and his hand is fine. The woman's eyes are gouged out and her hand was lit on fire. So this is a way to destroy an icon that initially represented being able to have power and teaching authority and now, and then that was destroyed. Very interesting combination of ideas and issues, if you ask me. I did get to go see this once and I don't know, I don't think they're letting people in anymore, but it's there to be talked about in terms of part of what's going on in this, in this ancient site. <clears throat> I'm sure most of you know that Turkey is well known for the ceramics because of the nature of the clay in uh, various parts of the region, but it significantly, com predominantly comes from the region of Cappadocia. But this kind of these kinds of designs, a lot of blue and red, uh, you will see all over the place. Um, I've started seeing bowls that I know were hand painted in Turkey in some of the stores around me, like. Well, I've seen them in home goods. You know, I've seen things like, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> Pier One. <clears throat> but these will all be hand done, hand painted when you're in this kind of a location for it. Um, all kinds of beautiful, beautiful pieces. So, and one time we did get to go in to see where they were actually spun, which was kind of fun. Um, the town of Aphrodisias, kind of, this is like at the tail end of the trip, and it's, in some ways, it is the most important in terms of helping to give a visual demonstration of visual propaganda, right? A visual representation of the power of the empire was to, was in this particular city called Aphrodisias. And it is a city that Paul visited. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is the primary focus of what this city represents for us in terms of helping us understand the impact, the importance of the <clears throat> imperial cult and the way that the empire chose to represent its, its power over its enemies, its power to maintain stability, right? So all these things play out. What we're looking at here, oh gosh, oh shoot. I think it's gonna keep going. So what we're looking at um, on the on both sides, right and left, it would have had, th there were three layers. So the first layer was where you could walk under a covered walk with those all those pillars, marble pillars. Then the second layer, second floor, had representations of some of the people that they dominate over, some of the people groups who are included in the empire. And then on the top of the, the top layer were other representations of the peop the the peop the power players, if you will. So it's a it's a visual reminder of all these different elements of you know of the Roman Empire, the people involved, the nations that they have conquered, all of those things. So after a while, you know, okay, we've seen we've seen marble statues, we've seen marble pillars, but this I want to keep my <laughs> ancient backgammon right board. Um, all kinds of really cool things. This is an inscription. <clears throat> this is one of those things done to, to Christianize a thing, right? Um, uh, so Aphrodisia is the goddess here. This is um, a couple, which you don't typically see this. All right, so these there are a couple of these uh, I, that I've put in this presentation, just to give you an idea. So this is the original that would have been on the second layer or maybe even the top layer. So um, I don't have all the people memorized, but Helios, um, god of the sun, is that an emperor on the left? Uh, so Sebastian, Sebastos, I don't know all the specifics, but we have P 
people, in particular, when you see a human um, displayed this way naked, it's usually a way to say this is um, divine. So whether this is an emperor or emperor's nephew or whatever. This is one of those really awful ones. Oh, dear. Um, so the female on the bottom is one of the conquered people. And the general on top is originally would have had some sort of, you know, he's some sort of thing he's impaling her with or taking beheading her, whatever. And then on the this piece itself at the bottom will be a name for whichever people group this is. But they were often represented by females, not all, but most of them represented as females and men conquering, dominating, um, all kinds of violence and domination, control, power that's being displayed here. Um, and this is the, you know, the billowing of the thing behind him, of his cloak or whatever, that's to, that's to represent the, the divini divinization of this emperor. And there's a podium or a pedestal, um, Ethnus Eudion. So the, the Jewish people, right, were a people group referred to as being represented in the empire that they were, you know, included in, dominated over by the empire. And so we did, it's an option to, to go visit an actual carpet store. I have mixed feelings about this, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, the tourist part of this, the exploitation of their work in general, um, how long these women work and their working conditions, and and it's a part of the carpet, it's a part of their economy. And so, so just noting that up front, but I have gone to, you know, we get to see, you know, silk, you know, all the whole thing. You get to see all the different pieces of how all this works. So mixed bag for me, um, but it's a, it's a possibility if that's of interest to people. Um, and the second or third time, I can't remember, when I went, went to see this carpet store, one of the guys pulled me aside and pointed out to me this version. This is only about this big, maybe maybe 12 inches wide and nine inches tall or so. And it was worth about $7,000 um, because it's pure silk. And this is, of course, the Last Supper. It's a very European picture. Well, maybe, maybe accurate. I don't know. But this is clearly a female, <laughs> which I think is fun. He's like, of course it's Mary Magdalene. I'm like, oh, oh, I didn't know that was an of, cor of course. All right, this is cool. Um, that was a Muslim man showing me that because Muslims actually highly regard uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, to be to be honest. Pamukkala is not necessarily on the, a stop on the trip, but it might be, so I thought I would include it. Um, this is because the, all the white is, is calcium carbonate that was in the water in the region, and when it comes up to the surface, um, it leaves behind the, the calcium. And, it's, and there are wading pools in it um, up at the top, and ah, I guess I didn't include one of those pictures of hanging out in it. It's kind of like a, you know, um, um, warm springs kind of a thing going on here. Cappadocia, as locals would say, Cappadocia, as many people would say, it is a region in the eastern part of Turkey. And there's a lot of church history that takes place here. One of the things about this region is there are cities underground, built underground. Um, some have you know, several floors, some have seven to nine different layers of, of this town or this region. And it's just mass. It's amazing. It's impressive. Um, so, um, so we, these are, there are a couple pictures of that, the underground cities basically. And there, it was safe, right? When people were coming through, it was a way to it's underground bunker. Like that's what it is. Right. Um, but, but laid out in such a way that people could survive for a while. This is referred to as erotic Valley. I don't know if you can see what's going on here. These are <clears throat> fairly phallic looking things. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of fun. Uh, that's a natural, by the way, this is natural. There's not any sort of human intervention to create the shape of these protrusions out of, out of the earth. Um, so this is, we're still in Cappadocia and there is, uh, there was a, it's a region in the early church and even up for several hundred years past the early church time frame. people, it was a place for ascetic living. And so one of the years that we went, we got to see this particular communal living space. And 
This is one of the most delightful things I've ever seen. I can't remember, was this from the 1200s, 1100, 1300? So there's, there's lore about this woman, St. Barbara, <clears throat> who, um, where's my cursor? Sorry. Uh, so there it is. Um, she woke up one morning and she had a full head of, a full beard. Um, and so I, she is a, I think she ought to be at least, um, a trans, what, what do we say? The, the, um, the saint. She ought to be the patron saint of trans realities because she is, she was a Christian person living in a, in a separated community. You wouldn't necessarily call it a monastery, but because it was, it was male, there were male and female living there. And here she is, her, her icon, the icon to her is that she is a trans male. Um, that's kind of fun. I think that's kind of fun. Um, <clears throat> human realities, what's happening now has always happened. We just don't have the stories to tell it all, right? So that's the Cappadocian region. Of course, we have to go see Tarsus, though there, I, again, I don't know what it's like now, but there wasn't a whole lot to see, but the town of Tarsus is allegedly Paul's hometown. Um, not his home base in terms of churches. That is actually the Syrian Antioch, which is definitely not something we can see at this point, given what's going on in Syria. Um, but that's the site, the thing to see in the town of Tarsus in relation to Paul. And then there are museums throughout the trip. And some of them I think just absolutely stunning. The things that you do see, the representation of animals used in worship, and we can tell that these are things that were pulled from Christian as well as Jewish worship spaces. Really fascinating to me. Lots of bovine, lots of feline represented throughout the region, the Anatolia, so ancient um, Asia Minor. And these, these cats um, were there were two sets of these, um, so greeting you outside the temple. Um, but, but in particular, in the middle, in the mid-region of, of Anatolia, where the Hittites were, uh, lots of feline used to represent the divine. And I thought I would wrap up this, this presentation with a mosaic depicting salvation, soteria, as a female. How fun is that? <laughs> so that's it. That's my presentation on a footsteps of Paul, and I would love it if you would let me know if you're interested. I'll leave my email um, somewhere where you can drop me an email to let me know. <laughs>